Go ahead, please. Okay. Dr. Peterson. And how do I turn the slide? Oh, got it. Okay, got it. Okay, we'll start here. Good evening, Vice President Mock, and thank you for having me, council members, uh, chamber members. Um, I am Dr. Jennifer Peterson, and I'm a pediatrician at All True Health System. I have been in Grand Forks since 2011. Um, I actually grew up here, so as a child, I grew up here and went to the grand old lady right next door. Graduated in 1989, so that's how old I am. Um, I am glad to be living in Grand Forks, and especially when this whole pandemic started, I was more than happy to be in a rural state. So it, you can never say enough about that. It's You just feel comfortable and be happy that you live in a place where things don't go kind of crazy and make you super nervous all the time. And we have, um, we have a great town and a great state to live in, so I'm thankful for that. Um, as the slide says, uh, I do work at the medical school as well. I work with third year medical students and I'm one of the pediatric clerkship directors, which I take that job very seriously. It's actually quite refreshing to work with medical students. They have fact checked my talk tonight and they did not find any errors in it. So <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Okay, so to make it light, uh, this is the history of COVID-19. So you'll see me refer to this virus as coronavirus, COVID-19, and you'll also hear SARS-CoV-2. So this virus has a lot of different names. If it was discovered or if the first case was reported literally one day later, it might have been COVID-20. So it's COVID-19, and in the world of medicine, that is actually a brand new virus, as you all know. In January, we just first got the genetic material for this virus. So that's actually quite fast in the world of evolution of viruses and virology. To be able to make a PCR test as fast as we did is actually quite incredible. In um, January 20th, the first case was confirmed in the United States. We all kind of sat back and said, okay, fine. Starting in March, we're going to calm down. We're not going to go to school. Our, um, our kids are going to stay home, and we're going to watch Netflix. Maybe you didn't watch that show, but um, I think it affected all of us, right? We all have a memory of at least hearing about it. And what we heard on the press conferences um, was 15 days to slow the curve. So now 15 days has literally turned into 160 days, and we have to figure out a way to live with this virus. So hopefully I can explain to you what this virus does to children and how we can live with it. So, so speaking about children, and that's who I see every day, I see infant, children, and adolescents. I don't take care of adults in medicine. My practice is limited to children. Um, I can tell you that right now, we really don't know the true incidence of the disease in children. I think nationwide and worldwide, we have done a pretty good job of keeping kids at home. I see kids every day in the clinic. I see parents every day in the clinic talking about their kids. And you would actually be surprised at the number of people that really have limited their lives to a significant degree since March. Some parents, this is the first time coming into the clinic with their child that they've had their children out of the house. And that just, to me, seems really kind of crazy, right? I mean, we've been keeping our kids inside for a long time. It's time to get them out, but we need to figure out how to get them out safely. So if you look at the United States population, children comprise 22% of the U.S. population. And looking at the 2020 census in North Dakota, that's actually quite similar. So children comprise about 22% of the North Dakota census, too. But interestingly, as of early August, only 7% of cases of SARS-CoV-2 were children. So... Is that going to change when our kids get out of the house and they go to school? Yes. And I'm not saying all kids stayed home because I saw plenty of kids playing outside this summer. Thank you so much for opening the swimming pools so that there could at least be an opportunity for them to do things safely. And hopefully they did social distance. I can tell you the teenagers did not do a very good job of social distancing and neither are our young adults, as you know from the numbers. But what we can say about children is that the children that do get coronavirus or COVID-19 they have a much lower incidence of hospitalization than adults do. So that makes us feel good. When we see viruses, we deal with influenza all the time. Children have a very high incidence of hospitalization from influenza when you compare them to adults. They tend to get sick and they tend to get complications of it. So that's why we like the influenza vaccine. Now, as far as... Um, what happens, though, is that of the children that get admitted, one in three need intensive care. And that's really quite unusual. So in Grand Forks, we don't have a pediatric intensive care unit. So our children that would need intensive care would end up probably going to Fargo or maybe to Minneapolis or maybe to Rochester to Mayo. So 
if one in three that are getting admitted are needing intensive care, that's, that's concerning. That tells me that those kids come in pretty sick. A new study that was just published this weekend um, detailed some viral loads for children in the United States, and they were looking mostly in Boston, Massachusetts at a, a hospital called Mass General. They showed that children actually have quite high viral loads in their nose, in their mouths, the first day or two that they get the virus. They have very high viral loads, much higher than actually the adults in the intensive care unit. So that's really interesting. They don't seem to be spreading the virus as much, we think, or we just haven't had the children out and about. So we will find this out very quickly. I think as school starts, as college starts, we will really find out how fast do children and young adults spread the virus. Many children that have the virus, as you know, are asymptomatic. So that can be sometimes up to 45% of children, which is a lot. Okay, so now when I see um, this little thing up in the top corner, and maybe it's hard to tell by the picture, not the world's best picture, I apologize, it's a motorcycle. All right, so when you guys hear the word Kawasaki, do you think of a motorcycle or a jet ski? You probably don't think of the same thing that I do in pediatrics. And what I think of is a disease that's called Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki syndrome is another name for it. There is um, a condition called Kawasaki disease that we've had going, we've, we've known about this in, for a long time. So at least 20 years in pediatrics, longer than that I'm sure, but I can tell you that in the last 20 years that I've been practicing, the treatment for that really has not changed a whole lot. We knew about the, the disease, we knew it happened, we knew it was a post-inflammatory condition, and the treatment is basically about the same as it was 20 years ago. Now, enter COVID-19, and here comes a new disease that's very similar to Kawasaki's, but the kids get a little sicker. So for Kawasaki disease, the kids that get that, um, there's about a 5% pediatric intensive care unit admission rate. And for multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which is a syndrome that happens, we think, due to COVID-19, they have a much higher incidence of pediatric intensive care admission. So this disease was first described um, in the United Kingdom, and then Italy, France, and then finally in the United States when COVID-19 hit New York. They had, um, it's now gone to the point where this disease has um, been d reported in 42 states. So nothing in North Dakota at this point, um, but we do get cases of Kawasaki syndrome in North Dakota, and I can't tell you exactly how many per year, um, but our guess is, as pediatricians at all true, we would say probably three to five per year. Very few of them require intensive care. That could be different with multi-system inflammatory syndrome. So the case definition for it is that they have to have a fever and they have to have an evidence of multi-system or, multi organ dysfunction. And there's usually a variety of other symptoms too, but one of the concerning things is that these children present in shock. And so they present very sick and they can have cardiac dysfunction, which equals sick in my world, right? And they usually need fluids and vasopressive agents, and that usually means they have to be in a pediatric intensive care. The good news is the overall mortality of it is relatively low, and as long as patients are recognized early, they are treated and they do well. Um, I didn't put any pictures of children being sick up here because nobody wants to see pictures of sick kids. Everybody wants to see pictures of healthy, happy kids, right? And when you think about it, if you have a child that's managed in a pediatric intensive care unit, the last thing you want is a picture of your child being put up on a, on a board or a bulletin. So anyway, the special things about this syndrome is that it happens about four weeks after the disease. So we don't see it right away when we see cases of COVID-19 in our community, but we tend to see it about four weeks later. And um, what we see is very high inflammatory markers. So there are special things that we look at as doctors that help us to determine how much inflammation is going on in this patient's body. Those numbers are sky high. And they can also have, like I said, the evidence of the cardiac dysfunction. And many of the children also have some stomach symptoms as well, meaning GI symptoms. Um, so it's not that they have the disease. It's that they have, they have had the disease. They've recovered from the disease. And now they have a post-inflammatory condition that we feel is secondary to the disease. So it's, it's kind of tricky and interesting. Um, and I just want you guys to know that when we talk about children and we talk about coronavirus, we talk about an awful lot of kids who don't really get that sick, right? So half the kids you see might not even get sick at all, ever. But there is a small subset, and it's not a large subset, it's a rare number, but there are kids that do get sick. And we've had in the United States so far, as of like the middle of August, I think, were the last numbers the CDC published, they said that about 600 children have been affected in the United States. 
17 in the state of Minnesota, one in South Dakota, and so far zero in North Dakota. It'd be great to keep it that way. So if we could do the social distancing, encourage good hand washing, and see if we can not get kids as sick this year, that would be great. Um, but kids have to go to school, and so we have to start school, and we have to figure out how, how to do it safely. So I propose that we do the best that we can. The numbers are here in our community and they're not dropping. Um, we need to follow public health's recommendations to slow the spread. And typically, like I said, children do well with the disease. Even healthy children that have no pre-existing medical conditions can still come down with the multi-system inflammatory condition. So it is important. It's also important to keep, keep our healthy kids healthy, but also our kids with medical conditions healthy. So... We'll work as a community to keep everyone healthy, and hopefully that does the job for us, right? I don't think this um, illness is going away anytime soon, so we all have to figure out how to live with it. I have references up here, and I'm open for questions if anyone has any. Thank you so much. Todd, you want to take a break now and ask questions if people have it? Okay, any discussion, Mr. Weber? Yes, if I may. Uh, Dr. Peterson, thank you for being here. Um, uh, the last couple of weeks when I hear Kawasaki, I, I, I no longer think of motorcycles. I'm thinking about this now. <laughs> yep. um, uh, so that's, that's serious and, and something for us to be aware of. But you also mentioned the high viral load. Mm -hmm. um, and yet there isn't currently a direct connection between that high viral load and increased infection rates around them. But we don't really know that yet. Uh, but these little kids are carrying around a lot of virus when they do have it. It seems to grow in them. Um, are there studies going on to help us connect the dots on that, if that is going to lead to higher rates of, of spread? Yep, absolutely. Um, so there is a pediatric hospitalist work group that's, um, they basically have a, a large multi-center study going on, and I don't know exactly how many centers are involved with it, but I think as schools are starting, there's ongoing concern that this virus may spread through the schools. And I think we will find out very quickly if that's happening. So we'll be looking for that multi-center study, and we'll also be looking at what's happening to regional and, and you know local numbers as the schools start. I can tell you that one of the best things that happened in March um, is we had a really bad influenza year. We had a lot of kids get sick, and it just it's not that it was bad that people were in the hospital being very ill. It was just a lot of people, a lot of numbers, a lot of kids in the clinic. And closing the schools in mid-March put an almost immediate stop, almost an immediate halt to our influenza numbers in the community. It was amazing how fast it slowed down. And I don't want to close school all the time. But <laughs> it just showed me that these little kids going around school, they are spreading germs. So if we can figure out a way for them to stop spreading germs but still be in school, that would be ideal. And our behaviors can have a tremendous impact on the infection rates. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Thanks yep. again for being here. Yep. Um, is there any research on or any way to know of chances of mutation of the disease that maybe children would be more susceptible? Um. Boy, that's a tough question. You know, it's um, it's probably a little bit above and beyond me to look at like virus mutation, but we do know that viruses mutate with time, and that's part of the reason why we have a different influenza vaccine come out every year mm -hmm. is because these viruses mutate and change. In the past, coronavirus was really not a very scary virus. We learned about it in med school. It was this cute little virus that had little crowns on it. I'm sorry. Um, and it just didn't really scare us. And then all of a sudden came SARS and MERS and now COVID-19. So is there potential for this virus to change and mutate? Absolutely. I would certainly not be the expert to talk about that, though. If I may, um, uh, from discussions with the expert panel, and Dr. Walls could speak to this more specifically, um, apparently there are more than a dozen, maybe even dozens of mutations, but so far uh, they don't seem to have uh, um, provided any particular need for further concern than what we already have. Uh, but that could change at any time because mutations do continue to occur. Um, another question I had was um, with teenagers, are they more like the young children where they're not seeing as severe symptoms or are they a little bit more like the young adults where we see almost more like adult symptoms? Because um, I'm concerned about the children but also about the yep. staff that they'll be around every day and potentially spreading too. Sure. Um, the 
infection that I spoke about, the multisystem inflammatory syndrome, is largely between the ages of one year and 16 years. And so we tend to not see that syndrome in older people. And we don't know why. Okay. I wish we will maybe someday. Um, the average age for that syndrome is eight, eight years. So when you look at teenagers, they seem to do, um, to do an awful lot. They, they have symptoms very similar to the young adults. And so things that can affect them might be medical problems that they already have um, that might make them have a more severe disease. But overall, they seem to do pretty well with it. Some large numbers of them are asymptomatic. If they have symptoms, it tends to be just a couple days of fever and usually not you know, sick for long periods of time. But I think we just don't have enough data yet of exactly what how, how each age group does with it. But we can say that largely under age 60, people do better. And then if you have medical conditions, pre-existing conditions, you don't do, you, you do worse. Um, and then one last question from me. Um, so during the cold and flu season, so what, what is the plan as we have little kids with runny noses <laughs> and coughs, like four months on end? Or do right. you, schools, parents, just take them in for COVID tests every other week? Or how are we... <laughs> Well, this is a great question. So if you, the million dollar question, right? Because if anybody in this room has a child, you know that your children have runny noses a lot. And if you're a teacher, you know that children have runny noses a lot. We can't keep kids out of school for everything. So I think um, what it's going to take is, you know, if it's an obvious thing that's noticeable to the teacher and distractible to the class, then that child probably does need to be evaluated. If they've about been, been evaluated several times and they don't have COVID, well, maybe that rhinorrhea is due to something else. So I think we're going to see a lot of that this year. I'm not going to be doing COVID tests on everybody that comes in with a runny nose. I will be doing it on some of them. And I think my partners would be doing the same. Fair enough. Um, any other questions? Anybody on the phone with questions? Yeah, Ms. Mock. Hi. Yes, Sandy. Mr. Sandy. Sorry, Dr. Peterson. I apologize for not being there in person. It's always <laughs> nice to be with you. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot, and I'm really sorry about this, but uh, during your commentary, you mentioned that you believe it's important that kids go to school. Can you please elaborate on that? Okay. Um, I'm happy to elaborate on that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to make sure I got your question right. You said that during my talk, I said that it's important to keep kids in school. And then you want me to elaborate yes. on that? Or tell me why. Why do you think that, yes, why do you think that's important? Okay. Why do I think it's important to keep kids in school? Uh, well, um, I think we all saw the effects of what happened between March and May when we went to distance learning. Um, we had... A lot of children that felt very frustrated with the way that that went. Obviously, it was a sudden change, and it wasn't expected by anybody. There was a huge variety in the way that kids were taught. So what was happening at grade schools might have been different than middle school, might have been different than high school, and even class to class, one teacher might have done something drastically different than another. And I think that, you know, just for the child, for the mental health of the child, I think it's important for them to be able to get back into what's normal for them in order for them to have good social emotional development and also to continue their education. I think those are important things. Kids need each other. They need people. They need exposures to people, meaning, um, good quality role models. And there's just certain things that are lacking with distance learning. Um, I know that this summer the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a recommendation that kids should be in school, so let's try to do everything we can to make it work. And there's also speaking of, you know, people that, kids that don't have adequate meals at home. I'm not saying that school should feed people all the time, but I know that we work very hard and I know there are some children that have that are hungry at home. And so I think there's a lot of things that play into it. It's not just the learning. It's the social and emotional development. It's the mental health of the children. It's their health, their overall health, I think that's important. Did could I answer I, your question I, okay, Dana? Yeah, could I jump in and, yes. and, and add something to that? And yes, have you absolutely. Check it out. So um, we also have a sense, as, as social workers, that uh, rates of domestic violence and, and child abuse are likely going up even though reporting is going down, mm -hmm. one of the, the main sources for that 
reporting potential is school. So there's a strong sense that these things are happening and we're not knowing about it. The school provides an opportunity for us to learn about this. Yep, and completely agree with that as well. There is... Um there's concern about that, whether or not it's actually happening. I think it probably is happening and just not getting reported. And so I think that um, I did a very informal survey this summer, didn't do a, <laughs> a research on it or anything, but I can tell you that every child I saw this summer, except for maybe two, and I see a lot of kids in the clinic, um, maybe two said that distance learning was great. But then when they said that, their parent looked at them like they were crazy. So most of the children told me that it wasn't fun, they didn't enjoy it. They didn't like sleeping in. They felt like their days and nights were getting mixed up. They, you know, felt isolated. And um, some of the funnest things that happened were when the teachers would figure out a way to make something exciting in their Zoom session. Something as simple as, like, bringing a little treat to their house and just leaving it on their doorstep. I mean, they crave that social interaction. And I think it's important that kids get it as safe as they can. Thank you. Any further yeah. discussion? Oh, Ms. Tucker? So this isn't so much a question for you, Dr. Peterson, but maybe just um, in saying that schools are a huge part of our social fabric, which is absolutely true. I firmly believe that our public education system is a, is a barometer for how healthy our community is, how our kids are doing, how engaged they are, um, all of those things. Um, but I do think that what COVID has made very apparent in the absence of schools being able to be open is that we as a community, and this isn't just Grand Forks, this is nationwide, that we as a community need to work on better social structures so that if something like this happens, which the cat is out of the bag now, mm -hmm. this is going to happen in the future, we need to figure out a new normal, and part of that is going to be making sure that our community is protected and that we're protecting our most vulnerable populations like our children, so that if something like this happens again and schools are shut down for months, we have mandated reporters in all areas that understand what they need to do in order to protect children and in order to protect abused family members that may need somebody to disclose to as well. Because it's not just children that disclose at schools, it's also their parents mm -hmm. that feel safe and go there and disclose what's going on so that they can get assistance. That also is for food. Kitsona has stepped up um, and given away backpacks for families that have needed it in a couple different ways giveaways recently and food and not just Kitsona but also other um, entities in town Spuds Jr. and all these other restaurants are stepping in to do this but I think that we as a city need to look at that and see what we're doing and what structures we're supplying and supporting our families with in the community to make sure that we're capturing this make sure that we're giving people the opportunities to feel safe um, and access the services that they need because a lot of this I think falls on schools falls on teachers um, and and teachers will pour their hearts out in the classroom social workers administration I have no doubt that that is the entire school system however that's also not what they're trained for Teachers aren't trained social workers or licensed social workers. They're not trained child psychologists. They're not, they're not uh, educationally equipped to fill all of those services. And so then we as a community need to look at that and address how it fills the gaps. So this is a conversation aside to itself, and this COVID one is going to go much longer, I'm sure. <laughs> but that's just something that I think that we as a city really need to start thinking about and addressing in how we structure our services to people and what we think about how our community should be and behave and act. Mm 